Thank you, everybody. Um, it's lovely to be here. Um, I think the juxtapositioning of, of uh, the papers is fantastic um, because this is probably led perfectly into what I wanted to say. We've heard the policies, we've heard the politicians, and uh, we've heard the generals, and now we're going to hear about the troops on the ground. Thousands and thousands of researchers busy doing all these kind of things um, around the world. Um, and I want you to contrast, and, and that's really what the really interesting thing is, is the contrast is quite enormous of, of what we're expecting people to do and what those people would like to do, ideally, <laughs> without being pushed. And of course, the real world isn't like that. We are pushed constantly. The second thing I'd like just to mention, and um, that picture's the deliberate picture. Uh, I'm told this year or next year, the vast majority of people will be accessing the web that way. For young people, that is their library, that is the exclusive way that they're going to access the web. The smartphone, the tablet, is actually a bigger game changer than social media. But the two together are enormously powerful. And for once, we have platforms that coincide the informal and the formal. And you will see, and we've done research on this in Europe, Europeana, is the smartphone generates a completely different information-seeking behavior and reading behavior than the tethered platforms for most of our systems have been designed for. So we got huge changes coming, massive changes, and not necessarily in the way that we expect. And of course, that is the, the characteristic of everything we've been doing. The other way that this is timely is I'm going to talk about a, a, a large research project, international research project done in the United States over here, um, looking at this whole concept of trust in scholarly communications, which is at the heart of everything, you know, because without trust, what is science, yes? And of course, we've looked at social media as part of that. But it's very timely because, in fact, the study's only just finished, and um, I'm always reminded, which is something that's so easy to forget, that an internet year is just simply seven weeks. Think about that. Okay, the, these are the big issues that are challenging trust as we've known it in the past and, as, and trust as we know it today. In today's crowded, dynamic, diverse, and disintermediated, do you remember when we used to go to a place of trust, like the library, to guarantee trust? Well, you know, that is largely gone for most people. It's more difficult ever to establish trustworthiness in the world in which we're living now. More sources, channels, platforms, players muddy in the water. We don't even know whose information it is anymore. So how can we attribute trust? Yes. The gates are open. We're opening them even more, as you can see. What's the consequence of that? And then we have, and we've been doing a lot of research on the Google generation who are now hitting universities now, now here hitting the, the workplaces and so on, their way of information seeking is very challenging indeed, and it is not likely to change. Skittering, poor evaluation skills, first one up, and completely different trust perceptions. Yeah. Are we watching to see what's coming from behind us? I doubt it. Of course, I've said this before, trust, authority, and quality matters everywhere, but are the very watchwords of scholarly communications. It is built upon quality insurance. Can you trust it? So this is a great place to look to see what happens in regarding trust. The bastion of the peer-reviewed journal, long established, hundreds of years, powerful and preeminent, being challenged by the social media juggernaut. What is going to happen? Well, we can see that some people are trying to fast track these events. We shall see. A little bit of background about the project. Again, the slides are available online on our website, so you can have a look at them. I will be bouncing around them. But effectively, we were looking at researchers as scholars 
as consumers and producers. Citation behavior, usage behavior, dis distribution, and publishing behavior. So from all those concepts. We were looking at the change drivers, Google, open access, social media. I'll only be talking about social media here, but the report is, is full of these other things as well. We were interested in diversity, especially age, because of the Google generation. Nationality, type of institution, gender, subject. And there are big changes. Methods, we threw the lot. We did usage, log analysis. We did focus groups, critical incident interviews, questionnaires, big and very robust evidence base. The biggest evidence base we have in recent times. Okay? We need to look at that. If we believe in science, we believe in data, then we need to look at the user, the marketing data. Scope, US, UK, but the questionnaire was international. Everybody's in there. Main focus today will be on social media. Well, personas. Researchers function in many capacities. And in these different capacities, their trust judgments are different. It's never straightforward. Speak to people and you'll find out. Editors, very interesting, and we spoke to lots of editors. Editors are the police of the established system. Yeah. Citation behavior, very political. There are people you have to cite to get published. Yeah. Now, it's in usage we need to look for the harbinger of change, because Researchers are much more free to use than they are to cite or to publish. They've got cuff, cuffs on in these other capacities. So if we see, we look to see how social media is doing in terms of usage, reading and viewing, then perhaps we might see seeds of change. Publishing, this is where, and we're all researchers, we're all academics, we're all publishers, we know that we are being drilled and beaten to publish in top-ranked, peer-reviewed journals for our careers, for, um, for all our benefits. Okay, we'll come back to that. What about metrics? We've touched on all metrics, I'd like to look at that here. Well, if you talk to everybody, they feel that, in fact, their world is driven by algorithms. They are constantly being engendered to actually perform at a certain ranking. Yeah? Everybody, universities, individuals, HR departments, they're all looking to rank you. The British Researcher Assessment Exercise, the Research Evaluation Framework, as it is now, is exactly doing that kind of thing. People talk about academics being a four-star or a three-star. Yeah? This is real. I live and work in universities. Metrics are, driven, are driving everything. Right. We need to look at the policies, where they're taking us in terms of this. One of the downsides, of course, and academics will admit it, yes, we have to publish in that journal, even though that is not my audience, but it's because it is a 2.7. Yeah? And that will get us the four star, which will get us the money for the department to employ the researchers. Yeah? How do you get out of that? But what it means is there's a lack of creativity, there's a lack of new ideas, because it's becoming stylized and standardized. Yeah? Scientists are completely unquestioning about these merits. They expect a dragooned, drilled system. Social science is uneasy. Humanities scholars are culturally uncomfortable and alienated, but they are measured the same way. So they are part of it. However, chink, we're always looking for chinks. It's not going to come overnight. It's going to come in the chinks. Early career researchers in social sciences and humanities thought themselves slaves, these are the words they use, to a metric-based journal-focused system. 
adhere to rules to climb an academic ladder, but thought the ladder was broken. In marked contrast, they thought journals were a manifestation, all that was wrong with scholarly communication, complete and utter opposite to what we've been hearing by everybody else. Okay. Breakthrough, the tsunami, the first sighting, or just a blip? Bought metrics, well, most researchers don't even know what they are. You have to tell them. Most are ignorant, and even those who have the knowledge see them as popularity indices. Now, for an academic, that is not such a good thing. Popular is one thing, quality is another. Okay, what is the, the current impact of social media on researchers and their activities. We're not talking about their social life. Many researchers are engaged at least occasionally, but occasionally is very much the word. Nothing more than that. Role mostly in usage. Okay, we'll come back to that. Rarely in citing and never really in publishing. They're much more critical. Well, it's new, why not? There's no standard ways of establishing whether anything is any good, and they are very hesitant about trusting social media. Don't mind using it, but trusting it is another thing. They do use the same standards to judge quality of social media as used for traditional sources. Look at it, evaluate it, read it. Who's the author? But what social media has done most of all is benefited informal scholarly communication. Now this is important, this is very important, because this drives the formal and are very much treated as such. But key to everything in the trust element, key to everything in distribution are the personal networks. Circles of trust are central to formal scholarly communications. But the developing of these, these groups and the maintenance are made much easier by social media. So it's quite a complex uh, relationship. The negatives. <clears throat> well, apart from the early career of the young researchers, most senior researchers only think that social media is a sideshow. Some, quite a few, the editors think it's a joke. Part of the problem lies for them in the validity problems. How can you trust it? How can you establish it? How can you verify it? But there are other reasons. Well, many are still novices. They're old, they've gone past the sell-by date perhaps, and they're antagonistic towards it because they don't know it. And somebody younger knows it, yeah? Their kids know it, they laugh about their kids. And most of them, have a social media account so they can keep in contact with their kids. Yeah? Interesting. These are senior Cambridge professors in physics telling us this. Yeah? This is really quite an interesting. No time to try it out. Well, we all say that, don't we? It's prior prioritization. Put off by the current HE climate. Yeah, in the UK, with the research of, uh, evaluation framework, you do not get any marks for social media. Yeah, okay, you could say knowledge transfer, that kind of thing. But the real marks come from the rankings of the four publications that have been published in peer-reviewed journals, yeah? That's where it comes from, so. Some people say the informal language of social media is unsuitable for scholarly discourse. Sounds almost Victorian. Right? No measures by which content could be evaluated. Yes, okay, there is a problem there. No benefits to it, it doesn't help their career. Whereas publishing in a top-ranked journal does, yeah? Intrinsic openness, now this is something interesting given the Commission's interest. Intrinsic openness of social media carries with it the possibility that non-experts would be involved. This represents noise, okay? What about the positives? Obtaining new ideas, stimulation, and starting new conversations. I think this is 
quite critical because it sounds as though in many cases the new, the innovative, is being driven out of top-ranked journals. In other words, to conform self-promotion of research and articles, books, conferences, this is quite important even for old fuddy-duddy academics. Passing around reference. Twitter's very good. It's used he quite heavily for moving around bibliographic references, how things are moved. And most of all, people are most interested in the fact that, in fact, could social media increase your citation counts? Because that would really make a difference to them. Now, I, I'm told that the research is rather open on this with a slight bias towards the fact that it can. In other words, it, whatever publicity comes is going to actually generate uh, views, citations, and so on. OK, so what about citing social media? Quite interesting. Young people, you speak to them and they say, PhD students, they say they'd love to actually cite something on social media, but their supervisors prevent them from doing that. So sometimes they actually sort of cover their ground by calling them personal communications, that old word we used in the old days for something that other than, than hard copy resources. Twitter not used an information source, it would be like citing a conversation in the bar. Blogs not to be sourced, many blogs were just stream of consciousness stuff. Yeah. Okay, this is. What about publishing, disseminating in the social media? Well, researchers under 30, they're not quite the Google generation, but nevertheless, by academic standards, uh, they are pretty young. Um, tended to agree with all of these statements. Mandates should encourage people to write a blog and or tweet about your research. You know, like mandates to publish in open access journals. Well, the next drill down is going to be this. And uh, they think that's a good idea. Uh, I use social media to get out information about my research because it's a reliable way to reach my target audiences. Yeah, they thought that. I tend to blog about the findings of my research, which is a good way to test that. So they, they, there's, there's a gap coming up. Now, this is an area where not only were the early career researchers saying, this is the benefits to them, and this is how they, but even the older a generation thought this was good. And one or two very senior researchers were saying that today they would have really fast-tracked the building up of that key community to which they have to belong before they can actually move around in that scientific world. You know, it took... You went to a conference, you then wrote a letter to somebody, said, hi, how are you? They might send something back to you. And it would take ages and ages to develop that important research community. But now you can fast track that because of social media and all the rest of it. So you can see here, nobody would disagree that social media actually has an enormous benefit here. Fast track development of personal network facilitates collaboration among researchers, finding researchers to work with in real time, stalking authors, I like that word, staying in touch with events, taking full advantage of the dissemination plus world they were part of. Yeah? Okay, so we can see some tremors. Now, this is interesting. This is young people saying disadvantages rather than old people saying disadvantages. It's despite the aforementioned advantage, young were reticent to contribute too much to the social media, largely because they did not want to let themselves down, show Im immaturity later on. It could damage their career. It is so easy to comment today, and in the digital world, the record is always there. So say you said something premature or immature 20 years ago, which is highly likely, it could come back and bite you at a crucial time in your career development. You know? I see, you said this. You know? The record is always there, you see. This is the problem. But uh, you get canny, don't you, as you do with everything. Um, Acknowledge social media was open to grandstanding, self-publishing promotion, but they thought that was part and parcel of the climb in the academic ladder. <laughs> so they were probably right. 
older researchers, they actually saw the greatest um, benefit to connect to the public and practitioners. And we are in the UK being driven to do that. Uh, and in Europe, of course, we've just heard that, is actually to connect to uh, transfer our information. Diversity country, we looked at countries all the way around the world, and of course there were different things. Those that felt shut out from the current system, who found it almost impossible to get published in nature and so on, tended to be people from the third world, and not surprisingly, these people actually thought that social media was, they had m much more positive attitudes towards alt metrics and social media because they felt that gave them an opportunity. Now, you know, the, the, at one time we always thought that subject was the big difference. It would divide and explain loads and loads of things. But I think we're all using a common platform now. We're all using common services, Google and all the rest of it. And I think we're beginning to conform. And the differences that existed before between science and social science and humanities are beginning to actually disappear. And we actually found this in, in much of our research. Humanities scholars were more likely to use social media than scientists and social scientists, having said that. And some people would say that explains partly the poor communication information system they've got. Well, we asked the great question, are things better now than they were 10 years ago? Well, that's always a, a difficult one to answer, isn't it? Um, because you've got this sort of back chat saying overload, rubbish, there's too many people publishing, there's too many people involved. You know, bring in more people and you're actually not going to rise. Are you going to, well, are you going to raise the standards or are you going to bring them down? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, academics don't like to talk about this because they're elitists at the one time, but they like to be, feel as though they're, you know, they're Democrats and, you know, we're all for everybody having everybody in. But most of the time they're trying to distance themselves from the pack, so they're very competitive. So this is quite interesting. So you ask them the question, is there more bad, bad rubbish stuff around now than there was 10 years ago? And they all think about this. And, and eventually, you know, they agree that there is more bad stuff around because it's more accessible, more opportunities to publish. Everybody is required to publish today, whereas before, if you weren't very good at publishing, you didn't publish, you taught. But now even teachers have to publish. So anyway, so the quality. But quality has risen over the years. Now, this is interesting. Now, and here's the explanation. There is a massive sea of mediocrity now because it's just easier to publish. And it will be bigger, won't it, in terms of the, the conversations we've been having earlier. The actual pool of information is growing all the time. But at the higher end, the quality is better because of better training, greater competition, and rewards of publishing. So, yeah, I, that feels right to me, that, that, that statement. It seems to reflect everything when you ask them this question. They say, yes, there's more rubbish around, but because competition has increased, at the higher end, performance is much, much better. And I think this is something we need to look at, is because we need to know what the outcomes of these policies are, not just that the policies are good, but what do they deliver? Yeah, better quality or not? Oh, isn't that what we're after? Quality, yes? Would anybody say we're not after quality? No one will say that, will they? <laughs> I've not heard anybody say it, anyway. Maybe it's coming. They didn't want any changes. They liked disintermediation. Do it yourself. Yeah. No one ever complained about information overload. Yeah, No one. Because they developed means of actually overcoming that. First, you don't look very far. Second, you ask a friend. An online community. Yeah, True. You know, I'm making it sound simplistic, but at the heart of it, that is what's happening. And they didn't blame social media at all for any reduction in terms of quality. The interesting thing is, I, I see you've got libraries on this afternoon. And I, I took out that slide because I didn't think I'd have time, but nobody 
talked about libraries at all in discussions. We, unless libraries were raised by the facilitators, by the interviews. It wasn't a question. They were never raised. Now you're talking about scholarly communication. You're talking about trust. Libraries were the guardians of trust. But nobody ever talked. They talked about them in nostalgic terms. Virtually none of them actually entered a library. Many of them were not even conscious that they were using library online services. Yeah. Libraries could be the first casualty. Okay, conclusions. What problem? As I said, we thought we were going there talking, asking questions, and we thought we'd be harangued by people saying, the world has gone mad. Yeah? There is so much stuff, so many platforms, so many people publishing, so many people contributing. How? And we're not, we haven't got any more time. Okay? We haven't, in fact, we've got less time because we've got all these things to do, Twitter, Facebook, whatever. Nobody's got any more time. Massive overload, don't know who it is, but what's the problem? Now to me, that seems like a problem, okay? But in fact, you'd have to introduce the problem to the discussion for them to discuss it as a problem. Okay. Played down the difficulty of establishing trustworthiness in the virtual world, not because there were none, because there were but because they have well-developed methods of establishing trust. Personal trust, trust communities build up over the years. This is the key for them. This, this is a second bullet point, but it's a powerful bullet point, I think, and it's something that maybe we think is correct, but we, we need to remember it, I think. Researchers have moved from a print-based system to a digital system in droves, I mean, massively, you know. But it has not significantly changed the way they decide what to trust. The digital transition has not led to a digital transformation. Parallel universe or the clash of the titans. Now, two things are going on at the same time, and two things seem like they are unmovable. Yeah? What happens? Road crash. The traditional scholarly system is being currently enforced and reinforced by increased competition, career considerations, established metrics, and institutional policy. It is as rock solid as you could imagine. It is now integrated in, in HR policies, H index. If you've got an H index or so and so, yes, you can appoint this person. If not, whatever else. You know, I've just been involved in, in something in Russia, exactly. You know, could you, yes, what's your H index? Uh, 29, okay, you know, we only accept 15 plus, all right, okay. So we have this in the UK, you know, the departments like my department, UCL, would get 50% of its money from, from this research exercise, 50%. Yeah. That's a phenomenal amount of money. And that, again, is based largely upon readings of four journals that you produce your best. How do you produce your best? Well, you say, right, okay, this is a nature one. Do you think the panel are gonna, even if they read it, are gonna say nature, no good? That we know, we know, we know that some journals have a high ranking and some have a low. And are you gonna challenge the high ranking? You know, do I get a halo effect by being in that journal? Of course I do, and that's why you go there. So on the one hand, the system is becoming more entrenched, more dominant, spreading its... You go abroad, you go to Malaysia like that, and they're constantly doing the same things as we're doing here. They're replicating the Russians. Everybody's doing... They want to be in the top 200 universities in the world. Yeah? That's overriding, overdriving everything. 
And we're just coal miners feeding into this system, yes? And even more so. So, on the one hand, the traditional system has never looked so good. Yeah? Publishers are having a great time. I work with publishers. But the, at the other side, coming down the other road, or coming at the other end of the railway tunnel, is social media. It is a juggernaut in terms of size, reach, all the rest of it. Increasingly useful for new ideas, references, publicity and outreach, communicating with pra practitioners, makes the whole process faster. Even those who didn't use it, the majority, that's right, thought it was the future. Yeah? Reluctantly and kicking. Yeah? So how do we reconcile those two? Or do they just naturally reconcile themselves? Surprises. Well, when we produce this work, and you can read the whole report, is people said, well, there's not a lot of surprises. You know, you've told us the peer review journal is preeminent and social media is sort of on the periphery. So what are you, what are you telling me? You know, that's the case. But will it change as a result? of new people coming into the market. Well, I think the surprises was how small the subject differences were. Let's rethink subject diversity. I think this could be old hat, yeah? And we need to think about it. We're being standardized by a common platform. Early career researchers need to be watched. Because clearly in the social sciences and humanities, not so much in science, where they're degrooned, 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 well, you know what I mean, driven by the, by, by the same system, by a tough system, so they're less likely to have room to freedom. Is it the first sign of the tsunami, or is it just a blip? Will the Google generation really have a major impact, or will they be beaten into submission by the system? Well, I think the EU are going to help the Google generation, from what I hear. OK, hey there. Back to the question posted by the conference. What was interesting, the conference's question was very similar to our research question. So that's really worked out well. Will social media change research and the publication process? Well, on the basis of the evidence of our research, that is, we are voyeurs, we listened, we watched, we listened. Of thousands and thousands of researchers, very high eminent researchers in all subjects, all fields, all countries, our view is this. Slowly, selectively, patchily, but surely, as the young and early career researchers move up the academic ladder. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Yeah, there is a, it's a loaded question. Um, but part of our research was, was about uh, the Google impact because um, the interesting thing, at one time people put Google in the camp of social media, didn't they? You know, it was the kind of, it wasn't scholarly, it was, uh, uh, um, our chair was saying today that, you know, many of the big things that have impacted on scholarly communication were actually d weren't designed for scholarly communication. Well, I think that's a good thing because I think lots of the things that are designed are actually not very friendly, but those that are designed for... And we're all digital consumers, aren't we? You know, we use everything at the same platform, book the BA flight, look at Science Direct and all the rest of it. When I noticed that something had changed, and I'll, I'll come to the question, is, is that we were studying Science Direct um, and we were looking at usage. We haven't talked about the usage logs as well. But, um, and at one time, um, Science Direct didn't allow Google bots to, to um, index um, physics content. Um, they could only go to the kind of, you know, the headlines and all the rest of it. And in one month, they changed their policy and allowed Google in deeply. Um, and the n amount of traffic coming into Google, um, uh, sorry, into Science Direct physics journals, went up immediately to 70% from Google, from nowhere, okay? So they'd only... In this study, if you talk to people about searching and discovery, they talk principally about Google and Google Scholar. These are researchers, these are the quality. They say they are surprisingly good and why they like Google and why they like Google Scholar over publisher platforms is because it, it not only is it more accessible, not, it's not more friendly, you don't need passwords, you don't need all those kinds of things, but you get a wider view, yes? And I, one of the EU papers was borderless information. We have moved into a borderless information environment. Hence, libraries are struggling to cope because the borders information seeking were once within the four walls. What happens when 80%, 90% of all journals are open access, therefore you don't even need to go to the big deal to do it, yeah? What happens there? Well, anyway, they are happy with Google. They really like Google. They find what they like in Google. They don't complain. However, for young people, there are, there are worries. If you look at their behavior, they spend very little time examining, evaluating, comparing. They tend to trust Google. First ones up are the ones that see. Do you know hardly anybody looks at page two on Google? Hardly anybody. Well, how do you know the first item on page two isn't the most relevant, just, it's just not the most accessible? Well, we have to be pragmatic. There's lots of stuff around. We haven't got much time. So in, in many ways, you know, ease of access is now driving what people are finding. Digital visibility counts absolutely massively. Just look at the logs. People spend, most people that, that search, bounce. They go in and out. In and, and they go somewhere else and go in and out. Searching has become horizontal rather than vertical. And this gets a very different form of behavior. And when you've got the smartphone, and the big thing is people are actually searching the smartphone in a social space, yeah? not even in the office space, in a social space, that searching is even more light, L-I-T-E. Yeah. So you take an abbreviated form of behavior, which we all have because we're dipping in and out of things, you take it to the smartphone, you get even more fast food or more light behavior. That's why I say when we look at you know, the plans of the, the European Committee and, and we look at social media, we need to bear in mind what already is on the road and what is likely to happen.
Okay, thank you very much for this uh, this, is beer. Talk. this is for you. Beer. It's not beer, it's, it's beer. tea. Germans it... only give us beer. We have tea. <laughs> <laughs> you have tea. <laughs>